Well, kia ora koutou. very, very warm welcome once again to St. George's Online Church Community and the third week in our journey of Advent. Seeing that second welcome clip um, reminds me how it's been very good this week to see pockets of our church community being able to come together and gather um, in creative but very legal ways. Those were the good people of our work in B. Those are the people who tend to our church grounds and keep them looking beautiful and what is a very sacred place actually to just to come and sit and reflect. And here's a little picture that they've created. It's what I call the hedgerow cross and it's lit up at night and I get the privilege of seeing this from our kitchen window. And this week I actually spent a few moments just using this as my reflection on the light of Christ coming into the world. It was very powerful, the cross and lights. Now another pocket of people that have been gathering has been our musicians and our singers as the choir and the orchestra have been busy rehearsing so that we can put together something very special for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And also two of our worship bands have come together and they sort of gave us the songs that we had for our worship last week and what you will hear in today's service. Another bunch of people that got together was about 15 of us who did a Advent pilgrimage, um, taking in the cathedral in Parnell, uh, Mount Wellington, and also St. George's, amongst other wonder wonderful sites and some meditations on Advent along the way. It was a way of evoking the spirit of the journey of Advent, the journey of the Magi, um, setting out on a destination to encounter the Christ child. And that kind of brings us to today and today's journey. Because today we want to focus on someone who tends to perhaps, although one of the central figures of this Christmas story, at times maybe gets a little bit overlooked. Now, of talking about, of course, Joseph. It's very telling, I think, and quite interesting that I will say Mary and Joseph rather than Joseph and Mary. Now, this is all very understandable, of course, and very good reasons for this, because Mary is the, she is the central human figure in the birth of Jesus Christ. She is Mother Mary, who obediently accepts God's call and then carries and gives birth to Jesus, Son of God. So, clearly, the central figure. But Joseph, too, has his own journey within this story. And sometimes, as I say, his role is perhaps less appreciated. And it's a crucial role, which is why we're really glad that Chris Clark today is going to look at Joseph and unpack this a little more for us. And his role in the world-changing event that is the Incarnation. But let's begin another postcards from Magi from our children, youth and families. Let's see where the, the Magi are up to in their own journey as they seek to encounter the Christ child. Here is a grid space for our tent. This shape, this one, this grid space for our tent. Yes, I agree. It's time for rest. In fact, let's take a proper rest. We've been on the road for weeks now, and we are all weary and grumpy. Yay, rest! Yep, all the struggling has been great. But I could do with a sleeper. You never know what wildlife might come to this warm too. You might be able to see a few examples of wildlife, young one. Yay! Hear me, all of you. Our most bountiful, wondrous, righteous ruler, Caesar, has a message for all citizens of his Roman world. You are to be counted, every one of you. You are to return to your town of origin, the place of your forefathers. Woman, you must go with your menfolk to their place of origin. You are to stay there until you have been counted. Our mighty ruler, Caesar, wants to know how many loyal and loving subjects he has. Each one of you are to be counted that he may know how many gifts he has come for Gifts given out of love and worship to him. Your mighty king, this is not optional, this is his decree. 
As they traveled, they really got to know each other, maybe more than they ever wanted to. This trip has been so great. Look at all my artwork. Whenever I see something amazing, I just want to stop and sketch it, and later fill it, fill it in for my memory. You want to know why this trip has taken so long? Yeah. Well, that's okay, because when you see a different rock formation, or sound, you stop us too. Yeah, and at night time, when we all wanted to go to sleep, you start around the stories by the campfire. Yep. So what do you think of the rock formation? Mary, I'm so sorry. I don't... I'm not sure if you realise this, but I am of the House of David. We must return to Bethlehem. Yes, a so long trip. I think we've crossed the border into Israel. Woohoo, we must be nearly there. Where will the king be? Borrow my mother's cousin's donkey. They don't have to leave Galilee. Okay, at least it could carry our bags. And you, if you become tired, or if you have the baby on the way. Getting birth alone in a strange place in the middle of nowhere, I hope not. Let's go to Jerusalem. I hope there's an amazing temple of worship there. I'd love to see it. Seems logical to me. Yeah, not sure about that. If this thing is to be unique and different, then surely God would have chosen a unique and different place for him to be born. Pray for peace, people everywhere. Listen to what I say. A child, a child, sleeping in the night. Now we light our third candle of Advent, Jesus Christ, Light of the World. And let us pray these words together. God of all hope and joy, open our hearts in expectant welcome, that your Son Jesus Christ at his coming may find in us a dwelling prepared for himself. Come, O come, Emmanuel, light of the world, word made flesh. Come, living Saviour, come to your world, which waits for you. Amen.
Joseph accepts Jesus as his son. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, "Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife." Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet: the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ the Word. Seriously, believe that Joseph, when he heard the news from Mary that she was pregnant, quietly and dispassionately considered the situation. He was heartbroken. He was humiliated. This was the woman he thought he was going to marry. This was the woman he cared for. His whole future had been thrown up in front of him. Here is a more contemporary take on how Joseph probably reacted to the news that Mary gave him. Now just leave it. I don't want to hear it. All right. Now just forget it. Oh. How could this happen? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just speechless. If we were getting married, I thought God was with us. Every time she speaks, I guess she was from my bone. I feel so betrayed. I feel so alone. I don't believe it. I just, I just can't. Because if it means what I think it does, she's broken my heart, and she won't. She won't stop with the half truths and the lies. Of course, she's played away from home. Either that, or she's putting away the pies. I can't believe she did this. She's got barely three months gone, and and what's more, she's got the nerve to say I've got it all wrong. <laughs> wrong? Oh, hang on. So you're talking about the opposite of right? You got a baby bump shown through your clothes, and now we're too tight. How could you do this? We made a vow not to go there till the wedding night. It breaks my heart. She's left me for another guy. But what makes it worse is her obsession to lie. I don't want your excuses. It's still to see. At least give me the decency of admitting you're a cheat. She tells a story. Listen, Joe, an angel appeared. Is she taking a mick or just being weird? Joe, I'm with child, a boy, a son. You know, there's an heir to David's throne. She says, "Well, he's the one." So, so you're giving birth to God's chosen son. This bun in your oven, then he's the one, as in the one who will reign for all the time. <laughs> Mary, have you had too much wine? Look, just just save it, all right? You made your bed, so lie in it. Oh, hang on, you already did, and there was someone else there with you in it. And that's why I stormed off and made my exit. So how could this happen? I'm speechless. I'm so lonely. I'm brokenhearted. She has broken my heart, and I feel so alone. Well, over the next few weeks, we're going to hear a lot about Mary. After all, this is very much Mary's story. But today, I want to introduce you to somebody who's normally a part actor, part of the story, but normally in the shadows rather than on the front stage. I want to introduce you to Joseph, betrothed to Mary, the stepfather of Jesus, who truly is, I think, one of the greatest unsung heroes of Scripture. Joseph, who acted with great courage and humility in taking a decision that would actually have implications for the rest of his life, Joseph, this extraordinary character who was chosen by God to stepfather his only begotten son, Joseph, who so shaped Jesus and his character that in years to come, Jesus himself would face many of the same challenges that Joseph faced, such as being humiliated, being ostracized, and being ridiculed. 
and face them with the same character that Joseph bought, except that in the case of Jesus, this time he was not spared death and saw a public humiliation and ultimately a public death. But to start, we know so little about Joseph. We know he's a carpenter. We know he's a good and honourable man. We know that he has the most extraordinary whakapapa dating back all the way to King David. He's betrothed to Mary in marriage. And in, in those times, marriage took on a very different form to how we know it today. Joseph and Mary probably knew each other. They grew up in small town Nazareth. But this was no love match, probably. In fact, what would have happened is the marriage would have been arranged by the parents. They'd have considered the two young people and considered that they were right for each other. And a binding contract, contract would have been entered into and a bride price played. At that point, uh, Joseph and Mary would have been considered married even though the actual marriage ceremony and the uh, uh, consummation wouldn't take place for up to a year later. And it's in this in-between stage, betrothal but not yet living together, a marriage not yet consummated, a marriage not yet celebrated, that the angel Gabriel appears to Mary with the extraordinary news. Now we know Mary is perplexed, she's confused and she's even fearful. But we know more than that, that she actually writes this extraordinary song where she talks about the fact that my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of me. And from now on, generations will call me blessed. But, despite that, she must have dreaded the task of telling Joseph, knowing at the very least he would have been disappointed and totally heartbroken. Knowing that he was highly unlikely to believe the line that God made me pregnant, especially given God hadn't spoken through the prophets for over 500 years. And knowing particularly that Joseph held in his hands the power to bring her before the church elders and to see her condemned and sentenced to death by stoning. For Joseph, that sense of betrayal, that sense of anger, that sense of disbelief must have been overwhelming. This was not the Mary he knew. But he also realised that her pregnancy would soon become a very public news in the face of her fast swelling tummy. He had to get ahead of the story because everyone would assume that he was the father, or if not, they would assume that even worse, that he was being humiliated and cuckooed by another man. So humiliated and ridiculed, he would have known that any prospect of a future marriage to anyone else was now looking highly unlikely unless he got ahead of the story. And in this case, the law was on his side. The law required that he bring Mary before the courts and the courts would decide her judgment and her judgment inevitably would be stoning publicly, costing her her life and indeed the baby Jesus. And it's at this point that we start to get the first glimpse as to why God chose Joseph just as much as he chose Mary to be the stepfather of his son. While Mary had seemingly behaved atrociously, he would act with dignity. So it's with a very heavy heart that Joseph decides that he will privately divorce Mary without drawing any attention to her, knowing that she still will face a life of poverty and humiliation, but at least sparing her death and death to their son. It was the only alternative that he faced, truly. Significantly deciding what he would do then the angel appears to him, and the angel tells him that this far-fetched, ridiculous story is actually true, and that Joseph too is caught up in this extraordinary personal yet cosmic story of how God is about to enter his world, and indeed that he has been chosen to step father the Messiah, the son of the living Lord. Now, we can be relatively confident about what happens next. Only Joseph and Mary received the dream. To everybody else, this was a scandal extraordinaire, especially in small town. A scandal that hinted of sex, of betrayal, and of inappropriate behaviour. That to everyone else, Joseph, Jesus would always be the bastard child of Joseph and Mary. The devastated parents, their humiliation, the whispers, the sniggers, the name calling. That for many people, they would have believed the right thing that Joseph should have done, in fact, would have been to bring Mary before the courts and see her stoned, if only to send a signal to others who might have contemplated similar reactions. Small towns, as we know, 
can be very, very tough on their own. Perhaps this explains why Joseph later on in the story will decide to take a heavily pregnant Mary all the way on a donkey across a very hilly land all the way to Bethlehem. Why? Because I suspect he was fearful of what would happen in the community if he left Mary alone to see her childbirth. And perhaps also explains that once they get to Bethlehem that there is no room in the family house and in fact they must find accommodation elsewhere. Now we're going to leave the story at that point. It's an extraordinary story but we've got more than enough to work with. Because first and foremost this is a story about family at its very very best. Just as we know very little about Joseph, we know very little about Jesus' early life apart from the birth narrative, apart from the flight to Egypt and a flight from the fact that he went missing one weekend and ended up uh, as a carpenter. But throughout his early years, he was surrounded by two exceptional parents. And this must have shaped his character. Joseph, this good and honourable man, this man who saw a higher justice and was willing to step beyond the requirements of society, the expectations of the church to a higher standard, to do the right thing, even though he would carry the consequences of doing the right thing for the rest of his life. And secondly, Mary, who risked everything, including the likelihood that she would be stoned and indeed lose the baby to say yes to God. Now God knew what he was doing. He chose to entrust the upbringing of his only son to two teenage parents, knowing their character would shape Jesus into the future. And of course, years later, Jesus would encounter many of the same circumstances that Joseph himself faced, including public humiliation, except that this time he wouldn't be spared the cross. Indeed, he would lose his life. Whenever God does something new, he chooses to involve the most unlikely people. And the reaction is invariably one of shock, of amazement, often outright fear and incredulity. And what God is asking us to do is to set aside our natural reactions, our sense of fear, our sense of trepidation, our sense of the unknown, to trust him and to accept that he will be with us, that he will be God Emmanuel, and that somehow or rather he will walk with us every step of the way. And I experienced something of this discombobulation in my own life. I just finished up as the CEO of the Hawke's Bay District Health Board and we were contemplating a couple of um, very um, career pinnacle jobs. One was in the UK and one was in Canada. And suddenly out of the blue, I got a phone call from Chris Grantham to say, hey, there's a job going at World Vision as CEO and I think you should be apply for it. I think you'd be really good. I was not pleased. Our carefully curated lives have been well planned and well executed to this point. We were looking forward to an adventure. We were looking forward to traveling overseas. I loved healthcare. I knew very little about international development, but I was looking forward to leading much bigger and much larger organizations. God completely discombobulated our plans. And that is the nature of what happens when God calls us and we say yes to God. The protection of God. Joseph and Mary, experienced both great pain and extraordinary joy as a consequence of their decision to say yes to God. And I guess most of us hope that if we do the right thing, if we do it for the right reasons, and if we're obedient to God, that somehow or other everything will turn out okay. Well, it appears that God does not spare us from the messiness of ordinary life, even when we do the right things and even when we're obedient to his call. Both but Joseph and Mary were soon to discover the consequences of saying yes to God, that the reputational stain will continue right through their lives, that many would have wished to have seen Mary stoned. And how many times did Joseph and Mary start to second guess that dream? Was this something of God? Had they got it right? Had they got it wrong? And even God's own son has not spared something of the messiness of life, forever known as the bastard child of Joseph and Mary, a refugee from a very young age, hated by the religious authorities, and many times escaping death and beatings. The only promise we are given when we say yes to God is simply this, that I am God Emmanuel. I will be with you and I will not forget you. Now I trained as a lawyer and I was introduced to the reasonable man test 
which lies at the heart of much civil law to this day. I.e. that would this action, considered by a court, be considered reasonable by the man on the Clapham omnibus? Now, it's a somewhat dated metaphor, but you get the idea that reasonableness, that rationality, and a certain degree of detachment matter. Well, you don't need to spend too much time in the story of Joseph and Mary to realize that actually God is anything but reasonable. Instead, we see something of the wildness, the passionate risk-taking, the freedom-seeking, passionate nature of God. And if you're not convinced yet by that, consider this, that God's entire redemptive plan turns on the response of two teenagers at prayer choosing to do the right thing. And as any parent of teenagers will know, that is a highly risky strategy, if not foolhardy. And there's no hint that God even had a plan B. Now, I'm not sure I fully understand the implications of such a risk-taking job, other than I think it suggests that God has a much higher estimation of the potential of human beings, including myself, than often we have in ourselves. In other words, he has a much stronger belief in us than often we have in ourselves. So today, we've considered a secondary character in the Nativity narrative. An accessory after the fact, seemingly. But one of the reasons I was so keen to introduce you to the story of Joseph was to remind you that I think in many ways he is one of the greatest unsung heroes in Scripture. But for a second reason. The lead actor in the story was never Mary. The lead actor in the story was never Joseph. The lead actor in these stories is always God. And this is the promise that God gives us when we say yes to him and yes to God. It is simply this that we're joining this risk-taking God and all he promises and all we need is that God is with us and God will not forget us. And that was the way it was always meant to be. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for this very special third week of Advent. Thank you, everyone, who's contributed to the service, and a really special thanks to Chris for their wonderful meditation on the role of Joseph. And it's a real, I think there's something there that can nourish us throughout the week. We can meditate on how do the responses of Joseph to God's calling, his role within that calling, How does that speak to our own responses in our calling, in all the various arenas of our lives? Some good stuff to to ponder on. 
As I sat here in the church, as you can see, each, each week we're sort of sitting in different parts of the church, and I couldn't help as I sat here on Friday afternoon think, just think one day we will walk up this aisle and we will share Holy Communion once again together. And won't that be a truly wondrous occasion? It really will. But God's with us. God has given us creative ways. We have to find creative ways to keep being a church community and keep being uh, a worshipping community right through Christmas into January. So for the rest of this week, I just say to you all, go now to love and to serve the Lord and go in peace. Amen. We go in the name of Christ. Mm -hmm.